Welcome to the first edition of a GWF webinar. Uh, my name is Sarah. I work for Geospatial Media. I'm the product manager for Geospatial World Forum and GWF webinars, and I will be your host for today. Uh, today we have two presentations on how location data strategy can help enterprise businesses navigate through global pandemic. And with us, we have two speakers. Our first speaker is Mr. Phil Lanzafame. He is the director of uh, Knowledge Solutions at Centara Healthcare. So Phil, would you like to say hi to the audience? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm broadcasting from southeastern Virginia in the US. Thank you, Phil. And our next speaker is uh, Mr. Sean Wang. He is the head of Data Labs at China Eastern Airlines. And Sean, Sean is based in Shanghai. It's 8 in the evening. Hi, Sean. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. I, I'm Sean Wang from China Eastern Airlines, and my location is Shanghai. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Sean. Phil, over to you. Great. Thank you. My first insight that you see on the side is the concept of strategy. As the heavyweight boxing champ Mike Tyson famously said, everyone has a plan until you get hit in the face. I think this pandemic was that hit in the face, at least for healthcare. While strategy is rarely about technology, it's more for prediction of how the future will present itself related to the things we can predict and some conditions we can only partially prepare for. I hope this presentation is designed to represent both of these elements. This is an old saying that is more relevant now than ever. On another level, the global concept defines the broader characteristics of geospatial information. The ability to describe external behaviors such as weather, distance, relationships, demographics, political boundaries, and transportation are the strengths that distinguish location intelligence from looking at data on a spreadsheet. Previously, when I worked to introduce the internet in the 1990s, I had to encourage people to think digitally. Now I'm in a similar position to have people to think geospatially. This was an introduction to the company I work for, Centera Healthcare. Um, as you see, it's located in southeastern Virginia and through the state, a little bit into North Carolina. Um, many in the international audience may not be familiar with the unique healthcare model of the U.S. where we separate healthcare treatment from the payments of healthcare. Centera combines both of these components under one umbrella. There is a broad range of services that provide a comprehensive inpatient and outpatient care that can be described as an integrated healthcare network. The complexities of these multiple services provide a diverse set of patients over a broad geographic area to provide a rich environment to utilize geospatial technology and concepts. So I'm going to try something here since this is a GIS presentation and show you a map to give you some context of what this means for our organization and probably a lot of organizations. So what you're seeing is a real-time traffic map made on the Esri platform. Uh, this normally lives on our intranet and describes all the Centera locations. So what I want to point out, and some of these you'll see again uh, later in the presentation, um, this is a hospital and these are hospitals, but I want to point out here the proximity to the water. And we have the Chesapeake Bay over here, we have the Atlantic Ocean over here, but as you see, there's tributaries and components, and it, this is quiet, it's early in the morning and most people are at home, but you are seeing some of the difficulties in the, um, in the traffic map here, you know, the red and the type things. But you see the concentration of services, and you can imagine the supply chains, but also the, the uh, prevalence of the water in proximity to the, the, the services. And we'll talk more about that. The other thing I wanna point out here, I hope everyone can see the map, is we're very dependent on bridges and tunnels. Bridges and tunnels are very precarious. They close, they have to be shut down during flooding, they have wrecks. So you have, you have these physical obstacles that prevent things from, from moving around. So we'll even go down further, a little further south to another one of our hospitals in Elizabeth City. Again, you see the proximity to water. These are all tidal waters, they're subject to flooding. We also have a propensity for hurricanes in this area. So from a geographical standpoint, this whole idea of transportation and, and location, I'll show you a couple other things here. As we move up the peninsula, we have more facilities. So as you move through these demographics, you're changing 
um, not just location, you're changing transportation, you're changing some of the things we talked about, weather. Um, I've been in conversations down here um, on a bright sunny day and I'm talking to someone, let's go up further north, up here in Northern Virginia and it's snowing there. So now you start getting into Northern Virginia, which is um, very close to Washington DC. Probably most of you are familiar with the great city of Washington, but now you're starting to see extreme traffic. And, and so once you get past this area here, Fredericksburg, traffic increases, but also the demographics are different. There's different ethnic populations, but again, you're seeing this, this um, aspect of water um, very close to the facilities. We'll do one more thing here. And we have two hospitals in the western part of the state. So from a geographic standpoint, they're not that far apart. But as you can clearly see here, we have a mountain range, the Blue Ridge Mountains that separate these things. This looks like a very short distance, an easy ride, it's not. So what you get into is a whole different set of geospatial circumstances here of, of snow, of uh, ice, uh, mountain runoff for flooding, and a whole set of issues there. So. You know, when you look at this as a whole and you look at it as a company, um, I, I do take the perspective when I do these things that we're looking at a, at a uh, maybe not global, but has the characteristics of a global organization. So I hope that gives you some context of the complexity and issues we'll be dealing with and the, and the patients we serve and the employees. Uh, just so you know, Sentara has 30,000 employees spread all over these facilities um, that are subject to all these different variables in, in temperature and climate change and flooding and so forth. So let's see if I get back to the slideshow and I got lucky. Okay, so we saw that, we saw the context of Sentara. Um, so we're gonna look at these topics here that we're gonna go over and I'll let you read those. Um, not necessarily in this order, but uh, it gives you kind of a thumbnail of what we're talking about and the challenges and opportunities in a healthcare organization. So now that you have a geo context of the organization, these are a few of the major topics that healthcare in general are confronted. I believe that directly or indirectly, geospatial science could have a dramatic impact on identifying problems and eliciting innovative solutions that would not have been available through traditional data analysis methods. The demographics reflect the diverse populations of where individuals live in relationship to culture, education, income, age, and lifestyle activities. Taking these into account into understanding a patient's care is a relatively new concept in the industry. External data from sources such as GIS, open data, and other sources will play a major component in understanding these factors. Healthcare is a supply intensive industry. It requires a variety of time sensitive specialty devices and products on a 24 seven schedule. This requires a range of delivery service from individual couriers, couriers to large shipments. It is also highly dependent on ambulance services that are delivered at the patient's home. Um, you see this very clearly in, in if you recognize that what has pandemic has done to the uh, uh, protective equipment that is necessary, um, understanding where it's at in the facilities, who has it, what type, respirators, masks, gowns, things like that. It's been a big challenge. This is one area that I believe GIS can have a number of opportunities and we're looking into that. So as we have seen, the, the whole issues of climate change, um, both the, the flooding, we're also subject to hurricanes and we have some other, other, um, other issues here. And then we have the concept of emergency management. How do we respond to first providers, um, paramedics, and some of the other things that, that are associated with healthcare. So um, the other thing is, it was an article in the paper the other day regarding um, the uh, uh, pandemic. So right now we're under lockdown. And if we have a hurricane, our hurricane starts the 1st of June, which we normally we set up shelters. How do you handle um, uh, shelters where you have people in close proximity and also have a lockdown of a pandemic vi virus? So these kind of compound the situation. So this is from the, our local paper. Uh, our area is called Hampton Roads. It's a, it's a uh, get my notes here. This area consists of six contiguous independent cities marketed collectively as Hampton Roads. As we saw, due to the proximity of ocean inlets and tidal rivers, we are the second most vulnerable area for severe flooding after New Orleans. <clears throat> Compounding this is the propensity for seasonal hurricanes 
and frequently a dangerous cousin called a nor'easter. Together, these components could have a devastating impact on our ability to deliver care, manage supplies, and provide support for the community. While these concerns are receiving significant attention at the city and state level, we are just beginning to use GIS to understand the implications for Sentara organization. We are working on several ongoing GIS projects to help analyze potential scenarios. We have downloaded the FEMA flood maps to the ESRI platform to establish a base map to help understand how to respond to these issues, determine which facilities and servers could be unavailable, how to identify and manage vulnerable patients, to fit, define critical time distance workforce, workforce capabilities, and manage emergency management and supply chain logistics. There's probably many more scenarios once we have understanding the dynamics and the, and the mapping related to all those things we showed you previously on the map. So, where do we start? For us, I work in the IT department in the data services area, so for us, it all starts at the data. As discussed previously, we have a number of different groups of individuals, patients, insurance members, employees, and physicians that participate in our healthcare activities. To make it more complex, an individual can be associated with one or multiple of these roles and have interactions with multiple facilities. This provides another GIS opportunity to visualize and identify overlapping relationships. The data services area work is in the process of consolidating data from multiple sources into a cloud data lake. A key, key components of assimilating the data is standardization and enrichment. GIS encoding is one aspect of the enrichment process. There are four location attributes or adding to any address element we have in our database. One is latitude and longitude, of course, the lingua franca of the GIS world. FIPS are used by the U.S. Census Bureau to identify legal and statistical entities for county, subdivision, places, and other location references. I have been closely following the what three words since their inception. It's an ingenious method to add immutable multilingual descriptions to locations underpinned by traditional lat long. They have been making significant progress and believe this will continue to evolve. The ubiquitous Google has their own locations product that uses their proprietary identity system. Given the reach, we believe is useful to include. Just for example, um, some statistics in this, we have uh, said 30,000 employees, we have millions of patients, or roughly 800,000 um, insurance members, and the um, hundreds of facilities. So all these will be geotagged with these four attributes as the data is ingested in the data lake. This is a little, a little deeper dive into some of the architecture. I won't spend some time, but I want to go over it because it's more than GSGIS, and you'll be seeing some of these things in the future. So this semantic enrichment layer consists of really standardizing and normalizing the data, um, adding um, clinical ontologies and terminologies, which you'll see later on, that extend and, and add context to our data rather than just the raw data. The other thing is the taxonomies that are associated with locations uh, understanding that we have multiple names, acronyms, and things like that. So we have one person standardizing on all the geospatial terminologies. Um, one thing I'll point out, because you'll see later on, is an addition of a graph database. And as we get into unstructured data, and then um, down here we saw the GIS component. So this is part of a bigger um, infrastructure, and we believe this is where you start because everything is driven by the data. Okay. This is a detail of the geocoding pipeline designed by our very talented engineer, James Johnson. It is designed to dynamically apply location coding as previously discussed to data as being ingested into the data lake. Most address data in the organization is already CAS certified for accuracy. This is done through a product that references US Postal Service data to verify the accuracy of the address and apply the standards required for mailing automation systems. Through a series of Python scripts through Spark Processing, components the data enrichments are applied, the data is then available to be accessed by the Esri Enterprise Server and other geo-aware geo analytics programs such as Tableau, Search Engine, Graph Database, and AI tools. So let's get to some of the, the geospatial fun stuff and what we're doing here. I showed you previously, and this, this doesn't um, really reflect the scale, but this is a major medical center um, this is our flagship hospital, but it's really uh, multiple facilities that are that are joined together 
through one address. The one address for this place here is 600 Gresham Drive. The back of the building and all these little dots here represent different addresses and um, not addresses, different entrances and parking lots that are associated with it. This is a huge facility if anyone's ever got lost in a medical center. There's a medical school over here, children's doc, uh, hospital, all sorts of things that you can get lost in, particularly if you're old, sick, or elderly. So what we've been doing is to build kind of our virtual healthcare system is, is to map um, using the uh, data collector app from the Esri product, each of these address, giving them a description, giving them taxonomy, giving them a lat long Esri, what three words, and the Google apps, and then actually marking out the associated parking lots that are associated with these facilities. Also the entrances of where these go. So the next step is eventually is to put a geofence around this and start understanding as patients come into this facility of where they should go, who they are, uh, facilitate things like automated check-in and um, look where they should park, potentially if they're, if they're disabled or need a wheelchair or some form of, um, of intervention, they can, they can be addressed just like you're seeing at some of the fast food restaurants. So this is um, an interesting part of what we're doing. And this is the whole idea. And I'll give you one more one little piece of information. Uh, I saw the other day, going back to the what three words, <clears throat> that they have a um, Alexa training that allows you to, to use that voice um, of what three words, the three words to either um, pick you up or drop you off at an ad ad uh, address. We're not publicizing these, no, but if people figured out, they could use these to actually get to these through the um, uh, what three words application. So I probably need to go a little faster here because this takes a little longer than I thought. So anyway, the other thing we're doing is internal wayfinding beacons. And Tara's purchased 27,000 internal BLE beacons. Uh, they're in place at one of our hospitals. And the value is that they can get through the mobile app turn by turn instructions with a shop, any floor and any service in the, in the uh, facility. When you combine these with that external data, we have a complete roadmap of where you go, where you park, um, the entrance and how you find the service. When we combine those, you get one step further to that virtual organization. The other thing it gives us is a, a platform of geo-reference floor plans that we can begin to use for asset management, construction management, um, wayfinding, and a number of other things. Uh, this is another project we're working on, I'll go over briefly, and it's really a site selection, kind of reverses that. Um, this is for infusion centers. Infusion centers are where you get chemotherapy, blood treatments, and things like that. And what they were trying to understand is the, the dynamics of where patients go in relationship to these little black dots. Um, unlike other traditional site analysis that require uh, income and education, age, and so forth, we have a lot of characteristics of what, what conditions these people are, what age they are, how often they come, uh, a number of attributes that are, are part of the traditional. And every time we do this, it comes back with more questions, which probably means we're doing something right. Um, because people are, are, have not really uh, understood and looked at data in relationship to the driving distance as we talked about some of these bridges, tunnels, and some of the attributes associated with the, um, the clients we serve. So let's talk COVID because uh, um, this is this is an important thing. We we got involved kind of peripherally very early on with the COVID. Um, our, our GIS analyst Stephen is actually a grad student at Johns Hopkins that presented the uh, one of the first maps that was tracking the COVID the COVID virus internationally. And so we got an early link before it was really represented in the United States, and I sent it to the medical director. And it quickly went viral in the organization and became a, a, a focus of the, um, of the uh, COVID command center in the organization. And, and literally it became, you know, uh, GIS became on the map, as they say, uh, within the organization. This is something we have some, since done. And again, briefly, I'm going to go through this. And what it is doing, it is connecting directly to our patient data um, through an API to the Esri platform. And on this column, it'll show, and this is a little bit old, you can see it is, it's quite different. It'll populate any city and the number of positive cases. It has a correlated day-by-day -day component. If you click on them, it'll show where they are in the map. And um, on this side is the facility where these patients were tested at. And again, a day-by-day, -day, a day-by mapping, which was really extraordinary about this. This is the first time we were forced and, and inspired to do actual real-time connected data, it's refreshed every six hours 
and uh, it's become well accepted in the organization. A couple other features we put in here was the um, uh, business analyst COVID uh, planning report. There's a little tab on here. So it gives people some of the idea of what's going on is correlated to the city that it's related to, some of the statistics and dynamics. Uh, the other thing is a tapestry dashboard by county. And so you can click on that. So again, this whole idea of thinking geospatially is, is kind of my mantra and getting people engaged in not just the data, but where the uh, variables are within this. So in a short time, and I think this is probably where um, we start understanding what does this mean for the future? And the idea here is um, what we're trying to do is a data enriched connected organization if you kind of get the drift of what I've been presenting so far and the components that are associated with that. So one of the areas we're gonna to have to start looking at is not just our population, but large population, just like the, the tracing that's going on and, and this is hard to kind of look at, but there's a, a, a data set out there. Um, it's free. It's called the National Address Database provided by the uh, Department of Transportation. It's available in a, a geo, geo database, and it is every resident and every business in the city of, in the state of Virginia. And you see the little red dot here. This is my zip code in, in, in this area. So what this does, it gives us a huge um, base map of relationships and, and locations. There's no names associated, but it is, um, it is literally every address in there. From there, we can add itch, itch attributes of, of demographics, population, disease, and we can start applying that with our data on top of that to understand the larger um, spread of information of diseases, of flooding, and see how it affects the community at whole. Uh, one of the things we've been working with, this is not the actual product, this is a, a, a test we did with the Esri product, is um, space time cubes. Space time cubes are really interesting for complex information over a temporal uh, time and logistical framework. One of the things we're, we're gonna be working with on this product is uh, opioids. Uh, last year we did a lot of opioids, so now that we have the patient's home address geocoded, we can go in and we can document uh, where these patients live. Each of these little little modules here uh, represents, in this particular case, six years. We can make these anytime we want. And because it's three-dimensional, we can go in and explore these. And you see there's a lot of different layers you can drill in by the different attributes of the people. So we see this as a tremendous opportunity, again, to get away from the data and show things. Um, just showing people they've been very impressed with the concept. Uh, hopefully next year, if we do this again, I'll have some concrete um, examples for you on this. And so winding up here, this is kind of the, the grand finale. It's either going to wake you up or put you to sleep. So the point here is we're a healthcare company, not a GIS company. And what you're seeing, if you go back to that initial data architecture, is a graph database of patients. Here's a patient. They're blasted out. And this is an encounter. An encounter is a visit. Could be a doctor. These happen to be a hospital. But the critical thing to notice about this, to have locations, this is Centera Norfolk General Hospital, the one I showed you on the campus. This is the one Northern Virginia. So we're able to map now these patients against not just their location, but everything. These are pain scores, drugs. And you see here, there's a relationship between this drug and the ingredients of this drug. They don't take the same drug, but we can, through data enrichment, understand the deep relationships. So what we're working on a project with this is homelessness. Now, homelessness is not a, a fact, it's, it's an attribute. So what we can do is look at patients through this lens and these locations and see where they're showing up, how many times, for what conditions, what drugs they're on, and see if we can create interventions and map these through, through a, a geo mapping. Because all this data then, once we come up with a cohort, can be uh, exported. All right, so I'm getting there. Um, this is another aspect that you can use. You can use graph database just to show you it's geo aware. And um, the, what I'm trying to illustrate here, this is a, a, a reporting relationship. Actually, you'll see me over here. I report to Natalie, Natalie reports to the executives. But again, you'll see addresses. And this one is very interesting because you'll see that here's the Palmyra. It has a name, it has a zip code, it has a street address, it has lat long, and it has what three words. So going back to some of our scenarios here, within a flood zone or something, if we had to close this facility, we know all the people that work there, we know their roles, we can, we can either move them, and remember, these are all negotiable and navigable and searchable. 
So we can get this data, we can move it to a map, we can move those in between and see these and add the attributes like flooding and, and other things dynamically um, looking at this data. So real quickly, there's one more thing that we've, we've put in the mix here, um, construction management. And can, this is a, a picture of a BIM, which is a Revit file. Um, what these are, very complex renderings of, they're built by the architects that display the, um, the mechanical, plumbing, electrical components. You, they're, they're 3D, you can go inside of them. And eventually, someday, all the things we talked about, the outdoor, the indoor, the wayfinding, the beacons, the IOTs and everything, in addition to that virtual component that we just talked about, can be combined into a visual and data-driven um, virtual organization. Um, these are some of the products you probably recognize some of them. To do the geocoding, we have a product called Geocodia. Um, we're very sensitive about HIPAA and privacy, so we, we have a product that we actually mask. It gives us a little differential. And uh, we're getting ready to enter at the uh, enterprise as a server connected to our data as we described previously. Real quickly, I want to want to give applause to the engineers and the people that are working on this. It's very complex. It's all driven by data. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces, but um, I want to thank you. So um, went faster than, than I expected, but, but we're at the end. Um, thank you very much. I hope this made sense. I'm the first presenter, so I guess I'm right for a few minutes to best. Um, there is a tremendous future. I think COVID is going to push us over the edge of, of doing some of the things we're talking here about using some of these features and functions. Um, if you're ever in my area, you can look up my office at Rapid Misty Change on what three words, and I'll buy you a cup of coffee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. This is very impressive work the center is doing with all GIS and location data. Um, in the interest of time, I think we will move on with uh, Sean's presentation for now, and we will take uh, all questions after Sean's presentation. Yeah, Sean, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm from China Eastern Airlines, and my my topic is all about um, some something about the business and model. It's all about the digital transformation and innovation how to meet the challenges of COVID-19. And the global aviation industry is most impacted by the COVID-19. A large number of routes have been closed. Price has been canceled. And the airlines have all have been impacted by foreign fuel price. And many companies have experienced layoff and even the and break and the and the aviation industry is going through an an persistent top period. In this slide, I would like to share my an um, insights and practical experience on how to uh, uh, set accelerate first digital transformation and innovation strategy to make the first stronger and better. And this and my slide have four topics. One is the how the aviation industry impacted by COVID nineteen, and the second is the value of the location big data in con controlling the um, COVID nineteen, and the third is how do first can survive in the this talk time, and the first third, and the four is my best practice or data transformation and innovation. And, and there's um, a few numbers. The aviation industry have been greatly impacted by COVID-19. On Tuesday and, and still days before, and British, British Railways said that said to the reduce employee numbers by almost um, 20,000. 20, and, and also the Scandinavian ARIS SAS allowance that it would cut um, through 5,000 staff. So, and all the ARIS, global ARIS, have been faced and great challenges, crisis challenges for all the 
aviation in the and airlines and airports companies. For but for business, I think huge challenges means the huge opportunities. First, can that the the first that can survive in in these tough environments. They can all they can all operational capabilities, market abilities, customer relations capabilities, and digital capabilities that. Uh, those capabilities will all greatly improve. So the way and um, the way we need to do is to find a new solution. I will show you a video about and um, the right the airlines industry impact by COVID nineteen. You can see on the Left side is um, last year, and the right side is this year. It's all, um, yeah. It's almost um, one tenth of last year. The, the flight number mm -hmm. of flights have a cut down. You can see lots of airlines have been faced a crisis challenges that never faced before. And you can see the the last part of this video. And and it's about the China it China industry airline industry <clears throat> because the um, efficiency systems improvements by the Chinese government government and use for the location technology and the location data the COVID nineteen in China has been well controlled and in in this and um, data. <clears throat> yeah. The flow of people and the logistics have have been shown it is its process growth, making um make, making products and prevention and uh, control a worldwide problem. Those flow data are type and uh, typically location data. So the whole and um, so, uh, so so the whole and um, social hit. And needs to develop public public and um, and COVID nineteen prevention and control service based on the location big data. Location big data is uh, as important as the pathology data. During this period, also there are challenges in and in sufficient data sharing and uh, conflict between citizens right to know the data privacy but the rational use of the data is an important step in efficiency pre preventing the controlling and covenant it 919 the covenant 19 insights maps and the data gray world pens ai robots and other location big data products have, have play a key role in many fields related to the and, and COVID-19 prevention and control. This is a picture or a research report. Mm -hmm. We can see very clearly and and it is this is or increased investment over the next two years. We can see on the right on the next slide, why the revenues and profit for British are being decreased, but some areas of an investment are expected to hold up. But over all the next two years, and fifty-eight percent of responded respondents expect investment in digital transformation and and to increase 
and uh, 60 percent is pet investment in automation and the deployments or ai to rise more than and more than 50 percent is pet investment in in the aviation in in the innovation to increase during the same period and 48 percent is paid to see an action to customer experience and service and this is a picture or uh, about the uh, china eastern airlines uh, digital uh, strategy Digital transformation is the cool strategy that may uh, may happen. Chinese Airlines digital transformation strategy focus on the following six areas: marketing, travel, operation, data and algorithm, innovative technologies and industry, successful implementations or digital transformation can make the business work better. Digital transformation will in enhance the First, cool competitiveness and give the first the flexibility to respond to the market trades. This is the customer journey. Customer journey is a career view of our business goals perspective. We focus on our customers and the customer experience. There are lots of business touch points along this customer journey. Every touch point is a part of our customer experience. Excellent customer experience can enhance first brand and improve customers' conversion rate. We focus on our customers. In order to provide customers with excellent experience, we have made lots of innovations. Some projects were incubated in the data labs. We could provide the data solutions and capabilities for, for those innovation teams. The teams all from different business fields or China Eastern Airlines group. We provide the capabilities to these teams to empower them to upgrade their ideas or products. They are usually very small in the beginning but as the value of the products or the project becomes more and more obvious the project has also received more investment and we have and in china eastern air rights group we have built more than and uh, more than five thousand digital systems in all our business fields because um, China Eastern Airlines is not just an airlines business. They also have a logistic and, and, and aircraft materials and also the house building. There's a, a big group in all business fields. So those systems has collect lots of data. We can make those digital states, we can make this Digital still uh, systems work better by data driving. But how to make the data to be more intelligent? In order to achieve this goal, we have to provide domain experts across the group with data mindset training and have a form alliance team across different departments. We have for developing AI solutions together. In our data labs, we have uh, we, we have to decide X brand. What does the X means? The, the, the X means has and it has three meanings. First, it means innovative technologies applied to a new business scenario or a business field. And the second, we need to focus on cost field business innovation. Third, we need to link and integrate variable resource inside or outside the firm. This resource include, includes include the data, algorithm, innovations, 
data talent, business knowledge and experience. This is an innovative business model or our data labs. Big data resourcization by scenario driven. On the left hand side are the new ideas or business scenarios designed by someone in our group as an input to the data labs. Then the data labs continue to incubate the scenario by building an alliance team. The members of this team will come from different departments and have a different professional backgrounds. The alliance team quickly develop MVP and MVP means a minimum, minimum, minimum rival products and through angel, angel inter, interactive development. If business scenario will have a clear business objective, such as reducing costs, improving, improving revenue, or optimizing process, or developing new products. Through this innovation platform, we can make more business opportunities possible. We have trained the cooperation model between IT departments and business departments. We just like an uh, in-house data solution consultant team. The business departments usually comes to us, us for data, new solutions, new insights, or the data capability training. We often form an alliance team to solve specific business problems. We work together due to the close in involvement of the business people, the success rates and customer satisfaction of the digital project is better than before. And we can transform and upgrade our business through the data. I think firms need to have three key capabilities, digitalization capabilities. And the second is data insight capability and data capability. The digitalization capability, capability means first can get more data from, data from the business touch points and operational process. Data insight capability, even you have a lot of data, but if the analysis does not have for the enough analytical and computing power, they can get the benefit from the data. Data productization, like data productization capability means how to commercialize the data. Decide the data solution, development or embed data analysis into our business process. This requires excellent create and created and the data mindset. Here's my uh, suggestions for successful deploying AI solutions. The first and the most important thing is to clarify the specific purpose or the and benefits of our business. What problems do we need to solve? We must know the we must know that the cool issues or AI commercialization is not the AI tech technology itself, but the business scenario. AI cannot do everything. We need to know what AI can do for us. Whether um, whether these products can help customers solve problems. In fact, customers do not know the specific business needs. Most of the time, they need to try and then find a perfect solution. The location data, the, the location data is, is terminal, variable data. But when using um, this location data, it's necessary, it's necessary to balance the legal compliance and the business value. I think the group is the first final business goal and to maintain continuous growth. The first must be able to face known and unknown race and the competent com competition. 
and they need to know their customers and provide them with a, with excellent customer experience. This requires first continue to innovate. Ari first needs to find his unique journey of digital transformation and innovation. And, and the mis mission of our team is very clearly. Everyone in labs will have all the capabilities and resources to make his innovative ideas to come true. And my slide is finished. Thank you, everyone. And and my thank you. You can, you can send me an email and my office email. Okay. Thank you, Sean. So I would like to invite both of you back on the screen. There were a couple of questions uh, during Phil's presentation. So I'm going to read them now. This one is from Akansha. Um, when you use national address database, do you also use gridded population as the number of people in each household might be different? Um, that's a great question because it only tells you the address, doesn't tell you the, the density of, of the addresses. So as we interpolate that with other data sets um, and, and attributes, then you can kind of derive that and interpolate it. But when you get into apartment buildings, it'll tell you how many, how many things, but then you get into other uh, aspects that they can drill down on that and give you some proximity to, to, to those populations. But no, it doesn't tell you how many people are in each, each facility. All right, and the second question was from Sanjay. How will disparate databases, data sets, uh, operating system, regulations, privacy, etc., affect the ability to take patient information and visualize meaningful insights for end users and first responders? Great point. And that's why we're approaching it systemically of tagging all the known addresses and any attributes we can derive from those. So it, and then you saw the, the graph database and uh, knowledge graph and, and, and Sean has that on his last uh, slide of one of their infrastructure components too. And so when you start creating the inference, essentially not necessarily knowing like the homeless population, we don't know where they are. We're looking for attributes and, and conditions within the clinical record of time, space, and so forth, and then and then interpolating those again and inferencing those to the knowledge graph, we can then um, populate those to the map and look at, at social components, crime, um, uh, you know, variables that, would, that that has the capabilities at the GIS level to introduce seasonality, um, distances, you know, frequency, and those kind of things. So it's kind of a multi-dimensional technology level, and I think Sean's say, saying the same thing. And then if you take it to AI, you're going to get some other layer of information from it. So it's not just one piece of data. I think what you alluded to is, and that's the, the purpose of putting everything in the data lake and adding what we call ontologies and relationships to it. You kind of get the big picture. Yeah, hope that helps. Okay. So we have one uh, new question just came. Uh, how important is the vertical location data or Z-axis data in the response to COVID-19? Maybe Sean, would you like to start first? Okay. What do you think is the why location is important to respond to COVID? Yeah, that's a great question. And in in China, and we have a, a great world plan. That that means that everybody needs to have a help code. And and the government will will know where, where you have a and touch and where you have been to a public place and restaurant, hotel, or a play or play, and who was in that and place or or in that and 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 in there what what you call and you know what what you call and, and so that we can find those people and, and then control and and control and, and we, we, we need to know their situations. Situations, you know, for 14 days, situations, then everybody is okay, everybody is how so, and this race, it has been and cut down. And, but the important thing is uh, how, how do 
how um, how those companies how to share their data because you know that there are a lot of different companies in involved in, in this mission like the ERI companies like the highway companies and like the hotel and also and lots of and transportation companies in in all in this group so how how do we use uh and and privacy to to share this data these are uh, top challenges for us both for us okay phil would you like to add yeah that's 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 a great point you know there was a there's a very interesting article in in the wall street journal this week on tracking um genomics the, the genome uh, globally real time and and there's a great map if anyone has has access to the number of studies so it's not just at the local level as sean was saying but you see what google's doing with with the, the tracing and and where you are from your phone and and there's so many ways and so many methods cell phones and stuff to understanding i think you start getting into a privacy issue at a certain point um healthcare is very peculiar and very particular about that um i think the ultimate answer is we don't know yet but it's very important yes okay um, there's one question from Brian uh, for Phil. What is the future impact of privacy laws and the ability to access the required data? You know, the, yeah, that's a great, great question. So the privacy laws um, are changing all the time. And it's not the privacy, it's the access to the data. And, and there's, there's been changes to do that, that allows uh, outside mobile apps, companies to get APIs to standardize the data, data interoperability. And so it, it's challenging because there's the perceived threat and then there's the real threat. And then there's obviously um, um, some scary stuff out there. So w that's why we're very peculiar. And if you saw in the data, we don't actually show addresses or we mask it with that product we talked to you about that gives us a offset that you can't track it back to the data. Um, obviously, we do things inside differently than uh, where we we're careful about it. So. We err on the sense of caution, and that's where you get into some kind of paradoxes between, you know, the value we just talked about of tracking people. If you know where I'm at and you know my age, um, vulnerability, and so forth, um, what is the options for reaching out and creating interventions or communication? So that's an ongoing issue in healthcare and also, I would imagine, in most industries. How much do you know about a customer? Yes, you, you mm -hmm. must bear it. Uh, um, public safety and uh, and personal privacy yeah true yeah it, it's a fine line and different countries obviously have different uh regulations and 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 and, and interventions to do with that and so i think you see that united states we're struggling with those issues um my kids are in college and, and the issue is can i go back to school if they're tested well, that's PHI. You can't tell someone you've been tested or positive or negative or anything. Um, yet we have conditions that affect other people's safety. And, and so these are issues that will be continue to be discussed um, probably globally. Right, right. And it's an ongoing discussion everywhere. Um, I think we should take our last question. Um, this is from Diodoni. Can we trace the individual's movements, for instance, if he moves from his location? I think the answer is yes. <laughs> can, can you tell if somebody moved? Is that the issue? Yeah, she was asking, can we trace the individual's movements, for instance, if he moves from his location? Uh, you can, and that's why we use. There's, there are, there are authoritative sources like the uh, National Address Postal System that tracks that, and that's public information. Um, we, we subscribe to it, and that's one of the data normalization components we have, um, assuming that they, they put in for a change of address and, and they live somewhere. Right. So maybe one more question for Sean. Uh, what does what AI or LI strategy that helps China Airlines directly to improve its business? And this great questions. And I, I, I been remember, and I've been and show that our business model in our data lab is the big data visualization by scenario driven. So why we 
set up uh, this AI or the um, DL and project. This all depend on how value how how value those these projects are. So we always come from a very very small projects and or very very small ideas. This these ideas or the innovation project comes from the front line or our business. Come from front line our business and then and they they form a, a an arrived team and get the capabilities that we provide with them and these capabilities and and includes the data analysis data analysis tools and the data and the business support he he or she needs so they move the projects all by themselves and and to the end this mvp is good or not all depends on their capability or their or the business goal is is right or wrong so if this project is good it's is very valuable for our companies so we can invest lots of money on this project so and this uh, and in this way in this way we can and take a very small risk to to build a really big project just a very small risk both for the pers person and the company Good. Okay. Thank you so much to both of our speakers, Phil and Sean. Thank you so much for great presentations. And thank you to the audience for being with us in the past one hour. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a nice day. Thank and you. to our speakers, stay safe.